works here. Uh, so we'll skip over that portion of the uh, introduction um, and we'll go straight into the review of our draft agenda with Mr. Bosch. So, so Madam Chair, if I could go out of order, we do have a special guest with us today and one of the items, it's C-19, is the reason why he's here. So we're going to move C-19 up to the top and it has to do with the, uh, the request for adopting a resolution related to certificates of participation. If we were to remember back in January, at the January workshop, a presentation was given by a colleague of Ford and Associates who was here. was talking about the two wings, one at uh, Lake Asbury Junior High and one at Oakley Junior High. And at that time, during this presentation, they kind of presented the idea that there's many documents. One does not borrow such uh, an amount of money without a lot of documents involved in it. Uh, and so here today is Jerry Ford, Ford & Associates, to kind of present this item for us. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, the guys don't let me out of the office much anymore, so I'm glad to be here. It's been a few years since I've been up with you. So as the superintendent said, um, in a short while you'll be hearing from us again, you'll be hearing from your attorneys, Greenberg Trout, that will come back with a set of financing documents, which we spoke to you about at that board workshop several months ago. And the superintendent is correct. There are a lot of documents, including the personal guarantee that each one of people saw. Not, not, not <laughs> 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 That's a good way to say it. <laughs> Only joking. The fact of the matter is, is we'll be borrowing sufficient funds to deposit $36 million into the project fund to construct the two wings that you just heard about. And in addition, we will be uh, depositing money to retire the debt for two outstanding issues that you have. Specifically, those would be the 2024 B, those would be uh, the existing loan that you have outstanding with Raymond James, one with PNC, and then your 2012 outstanding COPs. Why are we doing that? Well, a couple of reasons, but let me just step back and tell you how a refunding in the bond market works, or this type of bond works, as opposed to your home, home mortgage. When you go out and you refi your home mortgage, normally it is to save money, to lower your debt service cost, and when you have paid on that mortgage for 10 or 15 years and you refinance it, you usually extend it out for another 30 years. That's the way it works. That's not how this will be done. There will be no extension of the maturities on that outstanding debt. It will be refinanced only to its original maturity date that are in your documents now. There will be little if no savings overall from the refinancing of this debt. So why in the world are we doing this? Well, it's really pretty simple. The documents that your, your certificate of participation are under, it's called a master lease. And so, Fleming High, a number of the other facilities you've built, we have the second floor of one of your other schools uh, under this master lease, or did have it under the master lease. These documents are now more than 30 years old, about 30 years old, 25 to 30 years old. A lot of things have changed in the industry since then. They contain a number of provisions that are stale and not efficient for you. This was the clearest opportunity that your financing team had on your behalf to give you a modern, up-to-date set of documents so that moving forward, as you need to finance in the future, you will have a more streamlined set of documents that are consistent with industry practices that the rating agencies, investors, and bond insurers are more comfortable with than those documents you have now. We are not your bond counsel, we are not lawyers, we're your financial advisors, and we've discussed this extensively with your bond counsel, Bob Gang at Greenberg Trog, and that this is his recommendation, and we believe that that is the correct recommendation. So we can do this without you incurring a loss on that refinancing, and that's the reason that we're doing this going forward. So 
What will that result in? Well, after, if you look at 25 on out, which is when the new debt service will kick in, you'll add that $36 million and you'll have refinanced the three existing series. Your debt service will go up to somewhere close to between, let me look at it exactly here, or at least as exact as we can get today, because rates change. So it'll start out at about $6.5 million for a couple of years. It'll be just under $7 million, and then it'll level out at just under $4 million from then on to the end of the maturity schedule. So that's what will happen. What needs to take place for us to go ahead and put this in the market? You've engaged an underwriter. That underwriter is Raymond James and Company. They happen to be the folks who loaned you one of the outstanding issues, and so they will be the underwriter on this. There are a ton of documents that are done, all of great importance, but a key document is the equivalent of a stock prospectus. It's the preliminary offering statement that Susan has been working on now, Mike and his folks have been working on, and the lawyers have to turn around at the beginning of the day. We will send that to the rating agencies along with the other documents, and it will eventually be mailed to every prospective investor who takes a look at this transaction. But before we get to that, there's a master trust indenture which outlines this master lease program that you have. It will replace your existing one. There is a master lease in there, and in the future, as you go forward, you'll have supplements to these documents if you come in and finance again. And then there are a host of other documents that go along with it, and I'm not going to sit here and bore you with each one of those today because you'll receive a resolution with a stack about this high that will contain them all. But that one resolution on top of it will be a master resolution that will allow you to approve all the underlying documents and approve us going out into the marketplace with these securities. It will do so with some caveats. It will restrict the amount of money that we can pay your underwriters. It will limit that. It will limit the overall interest rate that we can incur in the market. So if the market tanked right as we were getting ready to go in and rates shot up, we could not go ahead and put this out there without your approval. But it will authorize the superintendent and the chair to go ahead and allow us to go forward with the transaction as long as it meets those parameters. Once that happens, once that happens, we will have ratings on the bond issues from the rating agencies. Most likely, we will have bond insurance from one of two bond insurance companies in the market. We will then mail this offering statement out to prospective investors. It will be with them for a week, maybe two weeks, and then we'll set a date and we will go into the market, meaning that Raymond James will at that point offer these bonds to the public. The folks that buy them will be a combination of major bond funds, what we call SMAs or single managed accounts, and those are investment advisors who basically manage money for individuals, and rather than pooling that money, they have a separate account for each one of those individuals that they manage those funds for. They are heavily involved in the first 10 years of any maturity structure at this point in time, and then there are a host of other investors out there. We'll go into the market one morning. We'll take about two to three hours to do that. We'll take a look at where the orders are, and we'll determine whether or not we have the right price on the bonds. If we don't have enough orders, we'll increase the yields on those bonds, increase the rates a little. If we have a lot of orders, we'll lower those rates somewhat until we find a place where we can lower them to a point where we lose some investors, but not so many investors that we can't complete the transaction. At that point in time, we'll call Susan, we'll call the superintendent, and we'll say, this is what we recommend, this is what the underwriters at Raymond James are offering you. We recommend that you accept this offering. They will say, yes, we do. There will be a handshake, and at that point, your rates are locked. And then we'll proceed to closing about two weeks later. There will be provisions in an agreement called the Bond Purchase Agreement between the underwriters and the school district. That outlines certain terms and conditions you have to meet. One of your ratings, no material financial changes. There are certain events. There's an act of war event in there. And we never think about that, but I happened to be in the Atlanta airport in 1991 when in the Delta 
Crown Room when we were watching on the big screen bombs coming into Baghdad right after I had priced a transaction for Hernando County Schools. And I thought, uh-oh, we have a war clause in the bond purchase agreement. So these things can be real from time to time. But barring major things like that, that agreement holds. It locks your price until closing. And then the superintendent, the chair, your staff will get together up here and they'll sign all of these 50 or so documents that it's going to take to get this transaction done. The following day, your funds will be wired and Mr. Kemp can go to work building his wings. So, in a nutshell, that is what's going on. Can I answer any questions for you? I just have one. Yes, ma'am. And maybe because I'm newer and I've never heard all this, it's kind of exciting when I hear you talk about what goes into it. But of the 36 million, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, what part of it is the incurred bond debt prior and what part of it? That's a great question. So, one, the 36 million is only the new money portion. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's only the portion for your two wings. That's what it's going to take. Okay. Okay. And then there is of the amount um, of the amount that we borrow, it takes about 10 million six to pay off the 2012 certificates. Mm -hmm. It takes another 10 million 50 thousand to pay off the 14s. And it takes about 713000 to pay off the 2017s. So when you look at it all, it's about $57.5 million. Okay. We plan on borrowing right now, and this is subject to change because the market changes, we'll actually borrow a little over $47 million, but the investors will pay us a premium for mm -hmm. those bonds. Um, Municipal bond market is funny. If you were going out and buying a treasury bond when it was newly issued, it's always at what we call par, 100% on the 100 cents on the dollar. If you brought a corporate bond at a new issue, same would be the case. Munis are not like that. Uh, we have investors that say, no, I want an interest payment stream. Today's market rate environment may be 3% for this particular maturity out in 10 years but I want an interest payment stream that generates 5.5% for my bond fund, and so they will pay us more than 100 cents on the dollar for that, thereby lowering the effective cost to you. And so they'll make that large payment up front. So that's why our principal amount that we borrow will be lower than what we fund for our projects, but at the end of the day, it's the proceeds that matter, and those proceeds are going to be in the neighborhood of $57.5 million. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Maybe maybe just give an overall analysis about the amount of money, the amount of debt the district has which in favor of versus other districts and other large entities like is the district borrowing more money than most organizations? And you have a you have a very low debt burden comparatively. If you look at growth districts, uh, if you look at a Duval, if you look at a Palm Beach, a Broward, a Sarasota, even a Manatee, uh, an Osceola, your debt, your debt burden is low. Uh, you've been very, very conservative. Mm -hmm. And listen, you, you know, we, we have a very basic philosophy. You don't borrow money that you don't need to borrow. You don't borrow more than you need. And you don't borrow it before you need it. Mm -hmm. But like anything else, debt is a tool. And it has an appropriate place in your project mix. And if you overweight in either direction, if you say, I want to pay everything with cash, and then you get, and then you deplete all of your funding for repair and for reasonable small pay as you go, you have a real problem. We've seen districts do that. If you borrow out the wazoo, and that's all you do, then you're gonna then you're gonna run into constraints on the other side. So the the goal is to find that spot in the middle that allows you to function efficiently over a period of years rather than just today. Any other, any other I, did, I had a question for, I don't think it's a question for him, so I guess we could do it after he leaves, not to take his time. Or, sure. um, I was just, oh, go ahead. Is, go ahead. I was curious, originally when we were talking about the, the debt of the wings, it was lower than 18 million of building. So I, I was curious if you could share with us. I thought I heard back in that meeting 
uh, between 12 or 10 and 12 million. What, I guess it's now 18 million a building? Well, we have to, you got to look at furniture, fixture, and equipment as well. When you add FF&E on top of the construction costs, we were anticipating eight, 18, we got $18 million will cover the construction and the furniture, fixture, and equipment required to put into the facility. So that's where we came up with the original $36 million. It's also, that's dollars, the cost please. of the building. So yeah. there's civil engineering and yeah. site work that Architect has to be done. It was like $10 million or so for the building, cool. and then there's... No, like like 14 for the building. I mean, that's just a standard RS means um, best practice price that they give us as an estimate for us to be able to borrow. And then we do an estimate based on each site how much we think it's going to cost. And again, these are all projections. Right. So, you know, once we, we get the final price. Um, but that's the price for everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. But the construction but site, cost, site will be different at each yeah. school. Right? Construction cost is three hundred, about three hundred dollars a square foot right now mm -hmm. in our market in the North Florida market. Three hundred, three hundred. We've been lucky to get three hundred dollars a square foot. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I was just going to use a historical perspective. A number of years ago, I saw this in the newspaper, Clay Today. Um, they have a five-year, ten-year, twenty-year background sort of thing, and I want to say it was maybe twenty years ago that a bond issue was put forth to the voters. And the whole purpose of that bond was to repair schools. And they denied it. They voted it down. And I sit back and I think, we only have a certain amount of money in our pool. We only have a certain amount of money that we can use to repair schools, to do schools. And as you said, the cost of those buildings just keeps going up. And the perfect, perfect comparison would be between Discovery Oaks and Spring Park Elementary. And whoa. So the fact that we are doing this now and managing the debt, which is huge. It's like we do in our families. If we use if we buy a car, we're going to incur a loan perhaps. And we're not going to buy a really expensive car if we can't afford that loan. And similarly, we can afford the debt with the help of Dr. No. <laughs> Um, but I, it, it, I was happy that I had a little bit of economics background in college to be able to understand. Um, so I was here when that referendum failed. I was working for you then. It's all the gray hair you can. Yeah. <laughs> but there are a couple things going on in the market more recently that make it really challenging. It makes it challenging for us in the marketplace. It makes it challenging for Dr. Legetko. It makes it challenging for your facilities folks. And a few different things. One. But rates are volatile right now. Mm -hmm. Interest rates are highly <coughs> volatile. Any of you that have been watching the markets will know that. Two, there are significant inflationary pr pressures that have been out there for the last few years. Prices have shot up across the board, and we're never convinced we have the right dollar amount for that project fund until we get a guaranteed maximum price. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we don't want to do is go out and borrow and have a shortfall that we have a gap that we have to come back because that's a very expensive borrowing if you have to come back and do that. So we want to make sure it's it's right size. And the cost escalation that we've seen around the state in school districts buildings is staggering. Uh, we have one client who uh, in 2021 gave us a number for a set of projects. They were wings, they were other additions. That number was about $75 million. Ten months, 11 months later, it was $125 million. Uh, we finally got it done. The contractor got efficient. We got about $10, $15 million back. But from 75 to $110 million, you know, is a wide string, a wide swing. And then <coughs> anytime you have supply chain issues, which have been going on for years now, started with COVID, mm -hmm. but the activities in the Middle East are affecting supply chain once again. Uh, those tend to disrupt things, drag things out, and increase costs. So we've got a lot of balls in the air that everybody's trying to balance. Well, Jerry, I, if, I, if I may, <clears throat> I think I've said it before, but I just want to make sure I say it again publicly as well. Probably the single biggest impact of COVID and the pandemic was cost of construction, supply and demand, right. labor supply. I just want to go on record and say our pandemic has never ended. And we didn't receive one additional capital funding revenue dollar to offset that from the legislature. So as we work on legislative priorities, 
all 67 counties in the state of Florida should be seriously looking at the fact that our pandemic has never ended. We're still still costing almost twice as much to do half of what we used to do. And you know, thank goodness for the voter support of the Ed First Half Cent Sales Tax because that was going to be prior to COVID. That was going to be what really got us to jump ahead on our on our maintenance. But COVID happened, so then we're, it just barely, barely let us stay where we are pre-COVID. You know, with the cost, so it's double the cost. Our pandemic has never ended. And when I talked to legislators about it, they said, "You know, Mike, you're right. Yeah, we should. We missed that. We should have done something about it." But nobody's doing anything about it. So just, just to let you know. And so I, I hope, I hope you understand that we flexibility for funding, flexibility for the, the way this board operates and the superintendent operates with flexibility to say, you know what, we're not going to build a school. We're mixing that. We're going to do classroom additions in the most fiscally responsible way to meet Mr. Addison's growth demand. That's the challenge that this board and boards beyond you are going to have for the next 10 years is how do we meet the growth in the most fiscally responsible way without penalizing the other 40 schools with our revenue or lack thereof. Well, my question was just to gander that type of information so that I fully understand if a constituent asks me what or why we proceed as we do. Yes, and as a school board member, I can attest when my propane used to be 225 a month and last week I paid 895 mm -hmm. I can fully attest that schools are not exempt from that. Right. And I appreciate you answering my questions. Well, we are far more comfortable when you ask questions and agree they're good questions than we are yes. when you do not. Right. The scariest thing for us is to have a client who goes into the market, borrows a significant amount of money, and asks no questions. That's frightening. So we love the questions. Thank you. As with all my presentations, and I try to put it out there as well, everything that we bring to the board and to the superintendent at the beginning is always estimated. Like, again, everything is estimated until you sign on that dotted line. And even then, throughout the year, budget-wise, you know that changes. So even this, this is more of an estimate at this time. It, you know, the change, the, the idea of the amount is our best guess, which we, as, as um, experienced as we are, we're taking that best guess and hope and pray, and we do pray, <laughs> that it stays within those numbers, because like you said, everything is going up. So I just want to put that out there. It is estimated until we sign on the dotted line. And the good news about that is that is what the budget is for, is to estimate it's not exact. Exactly. Thank I, you. I used to have to do it a five year out. Right. Kind of about tough. Mm -hmm. I wish I could because yeah. it's hard, but with the projections, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to know what's going to happen. Because we have these contracts coming years. and going. And you know, so we deal with the bell curve a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Too close yeah. to each other. And the legislature. And, and, and I think you have always can't, assumed yeah. Yeah. increases. Yeah. I think you've always been conservative in the sense of higher than. Oh, definitely. So you know, yeah. mm -hmm. What it's happens if enough. times get better, and it may, prices go down? The, the economy stabilizes, is that just extra money for us then to be used somewhere else? Like if our costs go down. On this project or on future Well, projects? I am just talking about we have this amount of money set forth for these projects mm -hmm. and the economy doesn't turn around, inflation goes down, things cost less, then I, I guess what I'm asking, are you obligated to spend all of it or can you... That's a, that, that's so can you build more things or the, the, the answer is number two you the, under federal regulations mm -hmm. you have to expend it according to a certain okay. schedule you have one right. you can't borrow more than you reasonably expect right. to spend over a three-year period right and then there are spin down requirements during that period of time if you have excess funds those funds can normally be used for other qualifying projects so we would have to get together with our attorneys and say, okay, this is what we want to use it for, well, this is news. how we will yeah. use it. Okay. Ms. Kipper, you had a question? Yeah, I, I just have a statement for us as a board moving forward and thinking about our growth, our overwhelming growth, um, and, and reflecting on this, and I personally, I'm friends with a few builders, but um, I've reached out to a couple of them and just made sure that I was 
accurate in this statement. But moving forward, I think we need to look at our school sizes because it costs more money to go back and build two additional buildings than it does to originally build it. And I guess, you know, at the time we didn't need it because the growth, whatever, but you look around you and if you see vacant land across the street, you know that's going to be houses. That's exactly where Clay County is going. If you look at a 10-year plan for Clay County, 6,600 homes, 7,700 homes, all of that, it's going to be there. So I just think if we're, if we're looking at funds and we want to be responsible um, with, our, with our use of money, I think we need to think about that in the future of building larger schools, especially when they cost $60 million to throw up. And then this building could have probably been like, don't quote me, God, do not quote me, but like <laughs> $2 million or $4 million versus $18 million. So I just, I feel like we need to start thinking about things like that, even though we're going to spend a little extra in the front end, it's going to save us a ton in the back end with everything that we do, not just building. But I just wanted to, I know I've said that time and time again and even brought a policy you know, last year thinking about that because we have to start being proactive. The growth is getting a bit crazy and I don't want us to be treading water, you know, trying to figure out what are we going to do because we don't have room and portables are not an option. 28, 29, and 30 is coming with a high school, a new high school build, which by then could be 200 million plus. $500,000 a classroom is the best. Be, like you're going to build a 30 classroom addition, you think 15 million on the taste market. 500, it's running about, with SREF standards, about 500 grand a classroom. It's the best projection for uh, when you talk to you. Mr. Baskey? Yeah, I would just echo what, what Ms. Skipper said and said, hey, you know, we'll have to look at building bigger buildings. But I'll also put a caveat as an educator to say that you reach a certain maximum, mm -hmm. it's that like there's a fine line mm -hmm. getting too big. Like right? so if you start to have elementary schools with 1,500 kids, that's unreasonable to manage. And when you look at um, a neighboring district uh, east of us <laughs> that has coastal property, they have far larger schools because of their weight. But I would also make the argument that that's, a, that's also another challenge. It might not be the, the best thing for students. Mm -hmm. and as an educator, I have to throw that little, little blurb in there. I agree with you. I think I echo those same concerns. Just part of what makes Clay County unique is that small town. Um, knowing each other, neighborhood schools, neighborhood schools. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's, um, I don't want to see that go by the wayside. I think there's a way that, like you said, we can balance the two together so that we're efficient financially, but we're also concerned about the quality of the education here. Perfect example, Flemingdale Elementary. If we had built that to spec to the needs that we could foresee in Fleming Island, if you go past Fleming Island Elementary now, you'll see a lot of empty portable spaces. You can tell where those electric cords or whatever boxes are posts. standing up, the posts that are out there. If we had built that, then we probably wouldn't have needed Thunderbolt Elementary, and we may not have needed, I don't know if Patterson was built first or Fleming Island, to be honest. Um, but when you start, look, or Spring Park, or um, Sony Pan Creek Elementary, but all of those kids would have been then bused to Fleming Island. And that's not necessarily, that takes away then from that neighborhood school environment. But with the other side of that, with our five-year plan, that's exactly what we're trying to do now, is set up that plan. And the state is the one who has to also say, yes, you can build at that size, or no, because you really don't have the numbers that you're anticipating. You don't have the numbers yet that you've proven to us that you can't accommodate at other schools in the area, which is so frustrating to me because I agree. I mean, we you can see this growth coming from miles away, and we saw it coming years ago. And Bill, I use I use you always use Shadowlon as the example, and it wasn't full. Yeah. Well, it I fell apart. And now you go to Shadow Line and it's like, shoo! Yeah. You know? I mean, I'm 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 limited land. And then now you have Green Cove, 
who has an abundance of land. So comparing that, I don't think that's, I mean, you could only build so much in Bloomin' Island. But so I mean, they had, they had the portables all lined up right, and ready to right. go. But and they had to take those away as we built other schools. Now, I think the fine people. line to be found would be that if the capacity is 800 or 1,000, you have classrooms for 800 or 1,000. Correct. Right. Not <coughs> correct. portables, which we are mm -hmm. not. That is definitely correct. the way we've been doing new schools. If I had to lean on my teacher expertise, I taught from schools with 300-something kids to schools mm -hmm. with 2,000-something kids. And I can tell you, Ms. Gilhausen, to add on to what you're saying, when you take an elementary school that's 300-something big, it is truly unique mm -hmm. and a family. Mm -hmm. And I will give kudos Sometimes too much to though. principals. <laughs> I will give kudos to principals who manage 1,200 elementary schools 1,200 elementary students, mm -hmm. and those were my worst years of teaching, because mm -hmm. it's much different than people think. There is a fine line, as Mr. Broski said, and I tend to, I guess, yield to the side of the community feel, it means because it affects teachers as well. It does, and it means something to a parent when the principal knows them and their child by name. Mm -hmm. That means something to a parent, and yes, to so. expect that for a school of 2,000 kids, it's an, yeah. almost an unreasonable ask for a principal to know intimately that many families. I wish we could have both, well go back and but we can't. Because yeah. yeah. okay. cool. yeah, it's 18, 36 million dollars now versus what we could have paid uh, like 8 million, you know, right. something like that. Again, God, do not quote me. But that is the point and the principle I'm trying to make it. Don't build the Whether place. if we mm -hmm. don't change our school size or whatever, if it's fit for a thousand kids, we need to accommodate for a thousand mm -hmm. kids, so we're not correct. coming back. Accommodate with permanent buildings. Right, correct, correct. 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 Yeah. Sure. Well, but to put it in perspective a little bit too, we're talking about six years down the road. As those people come in, we're going to be getting more tax dollars, we're going to be getting more funding. We're looking at today's price and estimating something six years away. We don't know what our price of collection is going to be at that point, mm -hmm. but it's going to be, you know, you know obviously COVID, at the supply chain messed up everything, but I think we don't need to panic because we know the half cent sales tax. Everything is going to increase to hopefully offset the increase. And that's all I'm saying. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. very difficult to predict the yeah. future, right? Because Shadow Lawn was projected to open in 08, 09, but we all yep. know what happened in 08. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that just didn't happen. Then it took 10 years. And didn't that affect Oak Leaf also? Didn't they build out and didn't sell as quickly as they expected to because of the housing market? Yeah, the Oak Leaf started in 2003. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we see yeah, the potential for growth, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily know what the housing market might have in store five or 10 years yeah. from now. So. Gotcha. And we don't have a crystal ball. No, for sure. Mr. Ford, you have Just a couple of things, if you don't mind. People who use crystal balls end up eating glass at some point in time. So <laughs> it's a good reason not to use one. But the discussion you're having right now is a critically important discussion. Between the three of us in our office, we have over 70 years in this business. Mm -hmm. We have worked for school districts that haven't grown much. We have worked for school districts that have had explosive growth during a 10, 12, 15 year span, those that have been much more mild, you are at the cusp of potentially explosive growth. Uh, you've got a neighbor just to your east that's going through that now who's a client of ours. You've got a neighbor to the north and east who's a client of ours who's going through this now. And as you're talking about sizes of facilities, those discussions won't end and they're good discussions to have. But one of the things to give yourself some insurance is the size of your core facilities, as your, fine, as your facility staff knows. Whether you put wings on it or not, if the core can accommodate mm -hmm. that additional infrastructure down the road, it gives you flexibility you might not have otherwise. But I want to go off script for a second because this raises an issue. As you go through this growth curve, if it occurs that way, one of the biggest challenges you're going to have is making sure that your cash flows fund your teachers properly, that they allow you to use pay-as-you-go to the extent you can for smaller projects, that you reserve your debt for larger projects. Mm -hmm. But all of that can't work well together unless you all as board members 
keep your liquidity where it needs to be and protect your fund balances and make sure that they're robust. Mm -hmm. Because once you draw them down, then, you, then you're put in a situation where your options become fewer and your cost of debt becomes higher. Mm -hmm. So if I could give you one piece of advice, it's to guard your fund balances and to protect your LCI dollars to the extent that you can and transfer as little of it out of actual capital as you can possibly do. Because that's where we've seen people really get stressed, mm -hmm. is when they have it all transferring out to the general fund to the max extent possible, mm -hmm. and they've let their fund balances go down, yeah. and now they're in the mess. Mm -hmm. So for what it's worth, that's just our opinion. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Thank Anything you. further from the board? Thanks for your time. Thank, thank you. We, we appreciate the expertise. Thank you, sir. And, and you had bought a house, right? You went to the meeting with a, with a mortgage person and you wound up with a yeah. document. So just imagine that the school district, what that is like. You need professional experts to do that. There's a separate set of attorneys. See, sir. There's a separate set of attorneys that deal with the bond issue of that from a legal perspective and do all that work. This is what they do for a living all across the state of Florida, so we're very good as far as that's concerned. Okay, so today we have the, the review of the agenda. We do have a presentation on Lexia, and then uh, Mr. Addison wants to talk about um, selling a piece of Queen Penn Creek Elementary property and offering that a community there. So this, this particular agenda is, um, I'm going to call it kind of light uh, for this particular month. When you look at the very first item, when you get into the uh, discussion agenda, is the public hearing for the K-12 social studies and K-12 science materials. You can see within that document that there's a list of books that are the choices for the social studies adoption. There's also a tab for the science adoption. So just to kind of give a quick review on how that process works, you know, companies submit to the state and the state reviews all of those. All of the books that we've chosen are on the state list. Right? They've already been approved. They've gone through that cycle for that. So there's nothing out there that's a book that hasn't been approved by the state of Florida. Uh, IT also reviews the books. One of the things that happens is that those books have to be compatible and be able to use for the online version. It used to be in my day, you used to have to get a book, like a physical book, and then you put them in your backpack mm -hmm. and you carry them around, those of us that are old enough. Now it's done electronically where the books are actually online. They go to the, the internet to get their textbook. They don't carry books around. So having, having it so that uh, their platform is compatible is, is an important feature to have. Specialists then review the materials, and they narrow it down to usually a top three to make sure that the books align with the standards. That would be important if a book uh, doesn't align with the standards. The standard is, in fact, what it is that should be taught, and it's what's assessed also, by the way. So that's important. The ease of use is, a, is also a, a factor that goes into that. Uh, how does it differentiate for our ELL students and our ESE students? So all of those things are taken into consideration. The top three is kind of thrown out there. A teacher selection committee then is formed, and they look at those and they rank them. Hey, here's our first choice. Here's our second choice. You can see that within the document, what their first and second choice is. All teachers are given an opportunity to rank. All teachers that teach that subject are given the opportunity to rank their choice. This particular situation was advertised um, in February, and now the public hearing now is in April. The material is publicly available on the website, as well as there's also a, a feedback form. Anybody that wants to give their feedback, they submit their feedback to it. So there's there's uh, a lot of rules involved in that, uh, statutes related to the adoption of materials, and of course we're in compliance with all of those, and this is the last step in the process and in the train to do that. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. <clears throat> so when I'm looking through the titles, almost every single book, for example, McGraw-Hill, Florida Chemistry, not just chemistry. Is that, that seems new to the me. Textbooks, <coughs> textbook companies now have realized that they need to change in order to, um, to meet, meet the market. You know, Florida, 
very specific a couple of years back in particular a strong stance against some books and some textbook publishers related to the content of books and so um, publishers have decided to Florida make a market just for Florida, Florida. <laughs> I was going to say Florida eyes. Florida eyes and chemistry. I'd like to know what that looks like. <laughs> I wonder how many states have said, I want the Florida book along with here. So I just wanted to kind of give a brief explanation to the process, assure the board that these are books that have all gone through the state vetting process, also vetted by, by uh, Clay County Schools and the teachers vote on, on which one of their top two choices. Uh, and then the I have heard positive feedback from many science teachers about the options this year. Um, we, in particular, when I was teaching, because I did teach science through this adoption, there was this big thick like book that used to go along with the, and the older kids never took the book, used the book, or cared for the book, and honestly we were throwing away a lot of books, and so I've heard a lot of great comments about, I have not seen it, but some smaller books and less costly and be more effective for the students, I think was the one they selected. And they were um, pleased with the, the choice to have that book. And about the Florida versions, I did serve on the State Instructional Material Committee for five years, not too long ago. And there was, we pretty much declined a lot of, almost everything that people submitted because there wasn't Florida specific standards, so I'm grateful that we have those choices as well. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a new addition. I don't remember seeing that in the past on our curriculum. So, so, so the other point that I would make about textbook adoption is, while the choices made are going to be the, the vast majority of teachers, there's always like a clear cut winner. There are people that actually wanted a different version mm -hmm. yeah, there are of it. Right? You're never going to get 100% to say, okay. that's the book I, I want or I believe is the best. Mm -hmm. But this is the most fair process for them. Okay, the next item is our meeting minutes. And then that's followed by the personnel consent agenda. Then the next is the proposed supplement allocation. Uh, we went through this process last year, but you know that each year in April, the board approves a supplement package. Um, I sent a link out with the supplement package, but I also provided you with the changes for, for this year's version of this. And this year's version adds what we're calling 23 demonstration teacher classroom supplements, which is a, essentially a person that is volunteering to be a model classroom and have others come to observe. One of the things that uh, we actually do a decent job at uh, through Dr. Shepard and, and Jenny Collins and crew is providing professional development opportunities for folks. You can't have teachers just make the assumption that every teacher becomes a teacher and has the capacity. The objective to provide some training. And so model um, model classroom teachers, they would have to videotape lessons to show other teachers. They would also have visitors to their classroom. They would go through coaching cycles, etc. The other additions, there's th really there's three changes when it comes to supplements. That's one. The other is a future educators program. What we want to do, you know, one of the things that um, um, became an issue is recruitment of teachers, right? We want to recruit teachers. We want to start with our own homegrown programs. So part of that is future, um, future Teachers of America uh, program at each one of our schools so that we can then provide information to students and promote teaching as a profession and get some homegrown teachers. The district has a strategic recruitment plan for teachers. I always laugh at some people, I'll be at a meeting with somebody that has a business and they'll say, well, you know, I, you're lucky, you don't have to deal with labor shortages. <laughs> and I go, what do you think, like we're immune because we're, we're educators? It doesn't, we're not immune from the same things that every other business in America has. And finding more teachers is definitely a challenge. This is one strategy within the strategic recruitment plan related to recruiting more teachers is to uh, enhance our programs at each of our schools to encourage students to become teachers. That, that sort of thing. And the third piece or third change is the restructuring uh, of our ESE program. Remember we went with the uh, ESE site, school site-based specialist 
when the conversion of doing that from staffing specialist to each, each individual school then would have a person dedicated to ESE services, that also alters the supplements related to that. Some are deleted because those other positions got deleted last month. Some are added because of that. This rectifies that. So only three changes related to this. The future educator program, uh, Melissa Matt is actually spearheading that. It's uh, our um, Florida Teacher of the Year. Mm -hmm. Florida Teacher of the Year. So I feel like uh, that's a very valuable you know, program that will take some time to kind of build over time for that. And so any questions about supplements? Was there supposed to be attachments to this so we could read we'll, about it? We'll add those attachments. We want to make sure that we gave you. The attachments are, are going to be the same as the, um, the, the link that I provided uh, you know, previously to you. The only changes are the ones that are on this piece of paper. But you'll see that document uh, the same as it was in the previous year. Okay. Other than these changes. Okay, the next one is uh, reappointments of instructional personnel. So uh, I just want to give you a broad concept. Only once a year do we have a separate item for reappointment of individuals. We have roughly 5,000 employees in Clay County Schools. Each year we go through a, a reappointment process. It's kind of like those of you that were in college or maybe when you graduated from high school. It's kind of like a checkoff list in order to, to then you know, graduate from high school, you had a checkoff list. If you out of college, you did the same thing. Well, there's certain things that people have to do in order to be reappointed for their job. So, for example, if a teacher doesn't recertify, we don't put them on the reappointment list until they fill out their recertification, because recertification is a requirement in order to be a teacher in the state of Florida. I tell you that because each year you're going to get a document, and the document will have a lot of names, right? There's 5,000 people. You know, some people, somebody will look through that document and they'll say, my name's not here. Mm -hmm. Well, did you fill out your paperwork? Did you, did you turn in your, your certification? Did you do? And we deal with that. Remember, this happens each month. So you got April, then you got May, then you got June, then you got July. The reason why this looks special to you is because the vast majority, the big bulk, is in April. There's other people that will be reappointed in May, June, July, August okay, as they complete their requirements. Administrators and probationary annual contract teachers are reappointed at the June meeting, the beginning of June. Okay? Uh, they're on a different schedule than, than everyone else. So if there is ever an issue like that, somebody contacts you and says, hey, I wasn't reappointed, whatever. Just send them, send them to me and to, to HR, and we'll, we'll deal with that particular issue. Um, and, and then every other month, it's part of the personnel consent agenda. Right? So there's not a separate item. That's why this is kind of special. It's a separate item because it's the bulk of people. The add-ons are done each and every month on the personnel consent agenda. So I hope I kind of explain that. Next is the um, <clears throat> Teacher Appreciation Weekend Day. It's the 6th through the 10th of May. Uh, May 7th is officially Teacher Appreciation Day. And our schools do a variety of celebrations across, uh, across the district as well they should to celebrate the excellent work of teachers. Next is the Proclamation for Administrative Professionals Week and Professional Day. I will tell you that that's one of the more, um, you know, just like I had nine jobs. And the person that's had the greatest impact on me usually is the administrative professionals. People like Bonnie when he first became superintendent. People like the many principal secretaries that were there. They kind of they kind of are the gel to what happens on a daily basis. And so we appreciate them. And that's a celebration of them. It's kind of normal at the end of the school year. You're going to get a lot of these kinds of things where we're recognizing those folks. The next item is um, uh, as they travel. That's a pretty routine item. Next is the uh, Florida Youth Challenge calendar. We're required to bring calendars to the board each time that there is a calendar, or in the case of a change, to a calendar. That's why you see calendars come to you, you know, all the time. Next is a uh, slight change involving ELL to our secondary summer programs. 
that you can see there, and that's followed by the uh, elementary summer program for BPK third grade summer reading camp, etc. Next is a is a is a program free to the district that Adult and Community Ed is having. It's an electrical training alliance in Jacksonville provides post secondary uh, educating adults within Clay County to help them gain their their uh, their competency in uh, electric electrical work. Okay, through our Adult and Community Ed program and uh, located at our Park High School in the Blue Wings. Next, you'll see a series of affiliation agreements between universities and Clay County, and the idea is to place interns there and try to get as many people as we can uh, to participate with us and so we can recruit them. By the way, if you're an intern here, you know, you get a personal visit, the HR goes out there and says, hey, how you doing? <laughs> You know, at the end of the year, you're going to be looking for a job. I know a great place. <laughs> Call Clay County. You know, here you go. So it is definitely a way that you bring people in. You know, most people, by the way, if they feel like they're part of a team and they feel like they're part of a group, that's what people are looking for. Yeah, pay is important, not diminishing pay. But, you know, um, pay is part of it, but also your ability to create a team atmosphere uh, and a place where people want to be is important. Next you see Arizona State University, same as, as the previous. Uh, I'm just glad you didn't say Next is uh, School Library Month is, is April. Okay, that's the month that we celebrate that. May is um, National School Nurses Week, May 6th through 12th, recognizing the work of nurses within our school system. Next is the um, month of the military child, which is April, and Purple Up Day is April 17th. Remember, we have seven Purple Star schools now, uh, highly involved into, uh, into making sure that our students that are uh, from military families that they're uh, taken care of within our school system because we have a higher percentage than most districts across the state also, so very important. There's not a limit to the number of purple school, no. star schools we've made. No. Okay. But it, it seems like certain communities have a higher concentration. Mm -hmm. yep. And so we try to target those those uh, little schools. And, and they do strive for that, which is, yeah. Well, what I found that interesting is that, the, is that the colors of the military, if you combine them all, they say that it's, it's, it's purple. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe that's an art experiment that we can. I kind of wish it was red, white, and blue. That's just a personal Red, white, and blue becomes purple if you mix them all together. Or just that we could wear red, white, and blue instead of purple. Mm -hmm. There you go. Hey. Uh, there's no proposed allocation changes uh, at this time. The next item, C-19, is the is the item that Jury Ford was here and explained to you. Um, so that's, that's there. Next is the monthly financial reports for February. Uh, and that's followed by the budget amendment report. Can we back up just sure. for a second? Sure. It's the monthly financial reports, when you're reading over the budget lines mm -hmm. and you see transferred from operations. Right. Is there not a way to like help us when we're looking at that to explain why that occurred? The transfers? Uh, or yes. where and we why? Cannot, yeah, we can summarize it. Most of those transfers, oh, I'm sorry, through the chair. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> most, most of those transfers are standard transfers between function and object codes, maybe uh, for instance, um, you know, uh, uh, 5100, mm -hmm. uh, 510, a supply item, uh, maybe a 6300, 510, meaning it's not a classroom expense, it's a school expense. So because of the classification of the function, we ended up, we end up trying to do the transfer so that we report it correctly so that we avoid audits at the end of the year. So, the, but we can do a summary page. I would be happy to do that. Because constituents will ask me, what does that mean? And I'm yeah. like, I don't really know. It just yeah. says transfer. And so even though it's for us and it's a simplified version, right. 
I've said this before, like when you change one job to another, right. it's helpful to see that pay increase and where those funds yeah. were found. Mm -hmm. That's just normal, like you would do at home too. Right. Like can we do this, where would we get the money from? When I look at the simplified version, mm -hmm. it's really not that simple. So it's almost like I need to okay. make it real simple. You know, that say simple, I mean, stupid for me because we're not budget people. And especially, there are actual constituents and citizens who actually look at that. Mm -hmm. And because that's all we get, right? Is right. that once yeah. a month view? And yeah. a lot of it is I can't. I can't make two cents of other than the fact that I know that you've done it. And that's all I was, right. I didn't know if there was a way to put like a little memo. You don't have to like. We can do a summary page that will like explain some of the major transfers. A lot of them will be basic transfers that it would be standard operating procedures that we would do internally. The budget's already there. Nothing's changed within the numbers. But we can identify the revenues coming in. There's new revenues coming in, so that means we identify the revenue and we identify the appropriation for that revenue. So because I, for us, when you're looking at the general fund, you see transfers in and transfers out. I have right. no idea where it's going or where it came from. Right, right. No, we can um, we can work on doing something for you. Um, it, the VP system is very mm -hmm. challenging because of you know the the transfers it's so many of them so yeah. as far as identifying each one because think about all the schools that are actually doing these transfers within their budget but i can work on something it may not be for the next month it may be a july one implementation I think it's important for you. that the, the but, average layman person can yes, understand, understand better our once a month snapshot no i agree i totally agree yeah. with that okay. because because, uh, you know, I want everyone to understand what they're looking at as far as the financial statement. Yeah. You know, so. Um, it could just be me. No, it's I've everyone. I've been looking at them for over a no, year now. No, it's everyone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's everyone. Well, not Beth. Beth oh, but Beth. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but yes, I will be happy to do that, but I do want to say that it may not be um, next month. It may be like a July 1 implementation, actually a September, because as you know, I don't bring financials the first three months because we're going through the budget approval process. So it'll be maybe a September or an October implementation. If I can do it before that, I will try. But yes, I totally agree. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, budget amendment reports. And then the... Uh the insufficient fund report looks like two checks from one high. Mm -hmm. Basically what that is, if you don't mind, uh, through the chair. Uh, it's, the first time we, it's the first time I've seen that. So That report, yeah, yes. Typically what so. happens is this is uh, internal accounts, and we're trying, uh, we try our best not to collect checks or mm -hmm. to collect cash. You know, but sometimes there are times where we do have checks that we, our parents pay for something or an activity, and it's not a good check. We do try our best, or at the school level, to collect every, to contact the parent, do all of the letters, do everything. Once that's done, then it is required statutorily that we do write those checks off and um, and bring it to the board and let you know that that check was uncollectible and it's a loss for the school district. Okay. So that's what it is. And sometimes it's not that many. So what we do is try to bring it periodically and we'll write down which okay. you know, so. Do we like let law enforcement know? Like, or, like uh, do you guys like notify about this? Notify who? The parent? Yeah, there's, there's attempts to collect. There's attempts to collect, but um, this no, we is don't. Like the last resort. Yeah, not law yeah. enforcement. No, we, we attempt to collect it through the parent. And um, we make several attempts, and then at that point we bring it to the board for write-off. And that's a loss at the school level. Yes. So there's no accountability to the parent if they decide to keep writing budget checks. I'm just no, we stop. We should well or you procedurally. Don't, you don't allow that person, person to write checks. another check. Okay. Procedurally, that's what I wanted to know. Yes. What What is the Okay. Because I had thought we were getting away from the check writing business, even as a we faculty are, member. In general, that's true. I mean, they might let a faculty member write a check, but it was very. We're transitioning to my school box. You know, okay. a lot of parents would like to use the credit card or to use debit cards to, okay. to pay for their students' lunches or any type of activity. Yeah. So we're focusing a lot on trying to, I mean, to utilize that program and do less collection of cash mm -hmm. and checks. It is a heartbeat moment when you send your 
eight year old with a twenty dollar bill yes. to pay for something. Exactly. <laughs> so cashless would be wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Okay, next is the payroll calendar. It's a pretty standard item. Deletion of certain items report. We do that. And then uh, you, you have the bid renewal for exterior door replacement, flooring, plumbing, and, and contract services for site work. Next is the final, substantial final completion of Keystone Heights Elementary School's cafeteria classroom running. Part of the procedures and processes that the, each step in the process is brought to the board. That's why you see the same item many times with slightly different wording. Same with uh, substantial and final completion for Batman Learning Center lighting and security. Next is the oversight committee. Uh, having that, having that uh, on the agenda. Next is uh, school concurrency proportionate share mitigation for uh, I believe 19 or 18 spots for um, a development of the Baxley Road, a total cost of a total amount collected would be six hundred thirteen thousand dollars you can see there. Mr. Broski, is that like a one lump sum impact fee or something? No. See, it's not. It's based on how many they plat at the time. So if they plat ten homes then they pay they pay that sh that portion of the plat. So okay. when we break this down there's a total cost. However, we divide that total cost by the total number of plats that they apply for. So as soon as that unit, let's say they come to the county and they want to, I mean, it's a 500 unit subdivision, but at that time, phase one is only 100 units, then they'll pay for those 100 units at that time. Is there an impact fee as well? Um, per house? So, how does that? That's a great question. Because <laughs> uh, I assume that was like an upfront no, impact fee. Answer. So, um, they will be credited for what they pay. So there are okay. credits. However, let's say that they only paid 4000 for that unit, then they'll have to pay the excess on their, mm -hmm. uh, they'll get a credit for that 4000 but they'll pay the okay. rest of the impact fee. Okay. Unless they get, a, unless they came out so much that if it comes out to more, let's say, for example, they have to pay more right. than what the impact fee credit is, then they, they, they donate that money to the school district. That's mm -hmm. that's the best way I okay. can put it, yes. Okay, next is uh, Lakeside Elementary School's uh, restroom yeah. renovation, followed by Orange Park uh, Elementary, pre-qualification of contractors, the Keystone Heights uh, visitor concession stand. Something that Keystone is, is Woo. Woo. Woo for Keystone. Orange Park uh, High School <laughs> uh, Media Center renovation. Get all the new stuff out there. Keep your woos down, please. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as Brian Jennings fire alarm uh, repair and replacement contract award, and then uh, you yeah, have Fleming Island um, erosion control. Uh, and then Wilbur High School cafeteria expansion completion and that that kind of completes the agenda so next next on the list is a presentation related to Alexia and we call you know in an effort to try to get information to the board you know earlier and earlier uh, there is no there is no item on the agenda for Alexia and when you looked at like uh, I ready and Penda that information is provided to the board months ahead of time there's no vote on this topic for at least six weeks uh, to kind of bring the information forward. The board kind of expressed a desire to learn about all of the computer programs that are within our, our school system. So this is an effort to do that. So this, you've already heard about iReady Math. That was Govinda Poor talking about that. That's used K-5. You've already heard about Penda, which is science, and that's used uh, three, Three through ten. Now this is this is Lexia, which is a, a reading um, program. Okay, this is Melanie MacGyver. She's the supervisor of, of reading, and she is going to conduct this presentation. Now she's excited to be here today. <laughs> when I said you have the opportunity to present this to the board. She said, "I'm excited to do." I'm in. Again, I'm Melanie McIver, Supervisor of Reading K-12 and Emergent Literacy, which is BPK. 
Uh, this is my first year in this role. I am very privileged to say that. However, this is my 24th year in the district. I don't know how I can say that, because just yesterday, I was uh, starting a classroom right down the road at Charles E. Bennett in fifth grade. So I don't know how I got to 24 years. But that journey has included fifth grade teaching, second grade, a curriculum coach, assistant principal, and now the honor of serving as a supervisor of reading. And I work with a great literacy team, and we have provided about 1,200 hours of um, intensive supports directed to, with teachers, grade levels, schools across the board. So I'm here today to talk about Lexia. So who is Lexia? Lexia is a company that has 40 years of experience in providing supports for professional learning um, and then solutions for curriculum and assessments. Uh, we currently utilize Lexia Core 5, which is a program for K-5, to and Power Up, which is the program that is used in 6th grade and intensive reading 7 through 10. We also utilize their letters, language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling, which is a professional development that is a very intense professional development of 300 hours. It's nationally recognized due to its work grounded in the science of reading. Um, it is wonderful learning around all of the components of reading, including brain development and how we progress as learners through reading. So, um, it is also a Florida pathway for reading endorsement for those teachers that need their reading endorsement. We have 150 teachers that have completed letters training since 2021. We have 80 teachers that are completing it currently this year, and about 25 that are completing the case study. Because not only do you have the learning, but then you also have to implement it through case studies. So I say all that because Lexia uses all of that research when they are creating their programs for support. So it is best aligned for our ELA standards, WIDA aligned for our ELL learners, and based on the science of reading, it is evidence-based, and it is rich in those offline resources for teachers to be able to dive in with students and give them that interaction that they need on specific skills. So why, did, why was Lexia chosen? Um, anytime that we choose a program, we always keep in mind the Florida's formula for reading success, which really, and they changed the name this year, so I've been having to practice it, um, really goes into taking those six components of reading, oral language development, phonological awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, comprehension. All of those must be present to build a skilled reader, which is also shown through Scarborough's Reading Rope, which is another one of those things that have come out through um, the science of reading research. So you'll see that all of the decisions that Florida makes are closely aligned to everything that is aligned to the science of reading because it is now in statute. And then the other part of that is Florida vetted programs and about three years ago they put out for grants and they said you can choose these programs. Lexia was the one that we chose through a, um, a group of teachers and district staff looked over it to say does this fit the need and really our main thing is Teachers are the power. So we wanted a program that really teachers are the drivers, they are the ones that make the decisions, and they have the supports. So that's where Lexia came from three years ago. So we are in our third year of implementation. Where am I pointing? There we go. So again, we use this for K-5, for core 5 and then power up for the upper grades. So when a student enters the program, the first time they take an assessment, that gives them an auto placement. It identifies where their gaps are and starts them on their pathway of learning based on those gaps to really fill in those gaps. So the program is based on a blended learning model. So the teacher directed instructions, there are resources available through the resource hub for whole group instruction, small group instruction that is all led by the teacher. Then there are the um, ongoing data process monitoring no good to use something without that ongoing monitoring for each individual student to know where they are and how they're progressing through the skills. And then the independent time, so there is independent time on the computer and there's also independent time where students can interact through paper. Decodables, which are those, I taught you the skills, now here's a book that uses those skills to see if you can apply what we have 
been working on. And then there are skill builders that scaffold through and have that practice for students, like off the computer base. And then they have the on computer base. So Lexia says um, each child has their own pathway. So every child has a different amount of minutes depending on where you are and where your gaps are. So for K-2, to two, it would only be 40 to 60 minutes per week. For 3 through 5, that could go up to 80 minutes depending on where your gaps start for a fifth grader. And then in sixth grade, we use it for 45 minutes per week. We've kind of set that goal. And then power up for our intensive reading classes could be anywhere from 30 to 80 minutes. Depending on where they are on the track, we've really reworked our intensive reading to be more diagnostic for what students need. So that's how it is used, but when is it used? So this is a snapshot of a, um, a master schedule guideline for K-2. So every content area has minutes that we meet within their day, student's day, so that they receive instruction. For reading, ours is guidelined by state statute. 108.25, that we must have that 90 minutes of uninterrupted reading. So if you can see here, that's that 90 minutes of uninterrupted reading at the top, and those are the core materials that we use um, to meet those minutes and to really service those kids in those um, components. And then we have an additional 60 minutes on top of the 90, so a total of 150 minutes in reading. So this is where you differentiate that instruction through small group to either provide interventions or to provide enrichment. And Lexia is when this is used. So usually, I just kind of did a snapshot of a small group time. So this would be your small group time. I, as a teacher, am leading a group. There is a group that might be working on a skill. They could be doing the skill builder that I've printed from Lexia that is designed just for where they are as a learner. It could be something that we're doing in class that week. And then I have another group that's working on the computer in Lexia. And then we would rotate. But the beauty of this is I can know exactly where my kids are working on the computer. And then if they're struggling on a skill, Lexia provides me the supports to use as a teacher in small group. I don't have to go search for it. It is right there. So that breaks down to about 9 to 10 minutes of computer work each day, which if you take out of the 150 minutes of the reading block, that's about 6% of their day. So that's K to 2, but what does it look like 3 to 5? So in grades 3 through 5, they have the same. You have 90 minutes of uninterrupted reading, and you have that intervention time block. And then Lexia is used um, during that intervention time block. Now their minutes increase because they have a little longer to go on the path sometimes. So it's about 16 minutes of computer work, which is about 10.6% of their whole reading block. Now. The beauty of this is sometimes you have those fifth graders that come in with a, a bigger gap. And as a fifth grade teacher, as, I, as a fifth grade teacher, I didn't have all of those resources for like beginning phonic skills or certain areas where they may have a gap. Through this, A, I can know where the gap is, and B, I can then provide those supports right where each kid needs it. So if I'm understanding you correctly, a fifth grade teacher then would have access to those phonics um, yes. instructional materials that otherwise throughout without Lexia they'd have they to They don't they would have to we would have to go Keep borrow from the second grade yeah. teacher or something. Right. You, know, you really have to search for that to find it sometimes. Um, so it, it does provide that. And I'm gonna show you how it's like at a click of a button. Wow. So <laughs> so <laughs> right from back from back I know. <laughs> so this is a snapshot from Lexia. Of, that's what we say they're using in the classroom, but really what does those minutes truly look like? So this is from Lexia, and this is the average time a K to uh, fifth grade student would be interacting. So it's about 67 minutes per week. So that average is out to about 13.4 minutes each week. The beauty of this too is as a teacher, I can decide, especially in the upper grades, we are doing DBQs this week. I'm going to need more time for that, so we're not going to interact with the computer as much. I might be doing something else. I might be pulling small groups to work on those DBQs while they're working on a DBQ. You can really alter it for your planning as a teacher. But then you would have days where the student may be on the computer a little longer. So for power up usage, this is a snapshot of it's about 74 minutes. Now, intensive reading, we have really changed the trajectory and the materials that are used in intensive reading. All students that are in intensive reading 
are screened before they are placed in a classroom and we use corrective decoding and other materials to really do direct instruction. Let's close those gaps for those students to get them out of intensive reading and get them to be proficient readers. So they have gone through a little bit of a change in intensive reading over the last three years. And part of that is Michelle Sato is our secondary intensive reading specialist and she is very eloquent and she has spoken to this as an intensive reading teacher that used the program. She says, and I'm, I'm not going to be quite as elo eloquent as she is, she says that it is very much like an MRI when a student takes that placement assessment in Lexia Power Up, it really diagnoses where those gaps are, whereas a secondary teacher, I didn't recognize that some of their gaps were, you know, that at the base of the learning room. So I can then have all of the tools to be able to, to help these students. She is much more eloquent, but that is basically the gist of how she kind of um, highlights her experience with Power Up. So what you're looking at now is a survey. We put out a survey in January to all, all ELA teachers, K to 10th grade, um, for intensive reading in the upper grades. We wanted to know, like, what do you think of the program? How are you using, using it? So one of the things we wanted to know is how are you using those resource tools, those offline tools with students? From resources, um, which is a little lower, so you know, kind of go, go down a little bit in this, but in our third year of implementation, we are seeing an increase in all of these areas. So the Classroom Hub provides supports for, if I have a student that's struggling on a lesson, but I don't know what that student is doing in that lesson, this provides me a pathway to be able to pull that student, let's do this lesson together. And then we work through it together, because sometimes it's a, I don't understand the directions. Sometimes it's a, I don't understand what I'm supposed to do, because it is a manipulative program too, so we're manipulating things, which helps them with other computer things. But that is one of those resources. And then the student achievement, which is only 52%, but I think it's higher than that, and I'll show you why in a minute. I think this is through the resource hub, but there are some other ways that teachers use to um, highlight student success. And then the part that we really have room for growth is that hub school to home. So Lexi provides letters for parents at each level to let you know, hey, this is what your child is working on. These are some things that you can do at home. But I think this is one of those things that's been kind of a hidden secret, and we're just now getting it to gain a little traction. You can do this at home then too? Or that's just information to send home? That one is just information to, to send home about what they're working on. We really kind of have them have students work within the program at school mostly. Um, that way if they are struggling with an area, it is a immediate, the data is immediate. So the teacher is notified if a student is struggling in a skill. So now, is there work that, let's just say, I don't know, comprehension, they're struggling with comprehension, comprehension. Does this program have something, like a click, you know, a couple steps, whatever, click mm -hmm. button, where you could go to comprehension and there's work that can be sent home? The printable work can be, yes. yes. Okay. Yes. For additional, I just didn't know this in particular program. I know they can go do whatever on their own time and find stuff, but I was wondering. But this that. one, it has that as well. Okay. I just want to interject, because I've used this program, mm -hmm. and I'll talk about it when you're done. Okay. How lovely it is. However, the resource hub to parent, uh, the school to home, yeah. it's time consuming if you have 125 kids. So it's not yes. that it wouldn't work. On that, so that's my idea for growth for next year, mm -hmm. is how to make it work a little time bit better. Consuming. Because we can do things, I believe, and I'll show you, I think the next slide, I think you might have been my segue. Um, yes, so I'm going to add that to this, okay? So there are a lot of resources in Lexia. Yes. It is great. It is a wealth of resources. But when you only have 30 minutes of planning and you're trying to make sure you get everything done, it can be very overwhelming. So as a literacy department, we really want to be responsive to what teachers are asking for and what they need. So we have created a curriculum guide. Um, we've been working on it to align to. So we have from phonics to reading is our core, and it tells you this week we're working on diphthongs. And then Lexia provides decodables on that skill. So we have provided the Lexia decodable, and then we have provided a, a companion piece to go with it so that the student then has activities to be able to interact with that decodable. So we also then have the downloadable 
uh, materials that would go with that. So if I see my whole class is struggling with diphthongs, I have a lesson that I can teach, and it, I know that it is vetted, it is aligned to the science of reading, I don't have to go search for it. It really does include all of those skills that we want teachers to include in a lesson, multi-sensory, direct instruction. Had I had this when I moved from fifth grade to second grade, <laughs> I, it would have been amazing um, because I didn't have that background for beginning phonics mm -hmm. moving from the intermediate grades to the, oh my goodness, they, they, I need to actually teach them all of these things. So this would be a great resource, and I think of that too with all of the new teachers that we have that we're onboarding. Like, what supports can we give them? So we wanted to create this. So this could be another way that we could download those letters and go ahead and have them at the ready for wherever you are within the program. So if you have a student that takes the diagnostic and um, you can see specifically where the gaps are, is there a hyperlink there? Oh yeah. Awesome. Yes. So this is, so that's second grade. Then this is fifth grade, so it gets into those comprehension things as well. So this week they were working on Paul Revere's Ride, which is one of my favorites. Um, and then this is what you do in whole group. But in small group, let's say the students are struggling with poetry. Lexia has resources to be able to pull that for small group, to have, to have that moment to teach students those gap skills that they need. So this covers not just reading, but also some um, like ELA and... Um, you know, so not just the foundational right, but benchmarks, like, but also those benchmarks... Yes. Okay. And so where you're learning, for example, like the structures of literature, the different forms of literature, if you have gaps in vocabulary about, like say they don't know what a hyperbole is or um, yes. they're looking for, or they don't know the skill of identifying, um, I want to say sarcasm or something like that that's a literary the device. tone and, and things right. like that. Right. Yeah. It, it has some tutorials for that also. It has some. I mean, it's... It probably doesn't have every little thing, but it has a lot mm -hmm. in there that meets those needs. Okay. Um, like drawing inferences and conclusions. Mm -hmm. It also has um, graphic organizers okay. that go along with it and some guided things that you can print for students that are struggling with that mm -hmm. so that they have a guided thing right there beside them okay. for reminders. I you guess what I'm looking for is like text analysis. Are they able to... Is there a, some sort of um, practice that they can get with how to, to analyze a text that they've read I for the different literary devices? If you don't mind. Uh -huh. I think. So back in the day when kids hated going in to achieve, I would say, let's do Lexia today. So what you're talking about, first of all, they, most kids really enjoy the interactive format. Mm -hmm. And when they go in, that broken down practice to their very individual need is done through that type of practice within that 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then the teacher can see if they still struggle with that, it can be reset. You, if, if it's still the same thing, mm -hmm. they can be directed to other lessons that could help support that. Okay. So that individual practice, and they have like the voices and things happening to say, oh no, this is how you do it. It's almost like how-to lessons yeah. in their 15 minutes. So again, it goes back to that they provide direct instruction, like mm -hmm. a, a I'm trying to remember my it's word, hard. the first level of instruction, your tier one instruction. Mm -hmm. And then if the student doesn't get it, they go to a guided practice. Yeah. And if they don't get it, they go to a direct instruction okay. to really make sure they're getting it. And it checks their progress and the teachers get that information. And then it warns yes. us. But this, so that's what they're doing online. Uh -huh. This yes. is offline. This is that resource a teacher can the print teacher. Mm -hmm. and use. But it marries to what they're, you know that they align because now they're hearing it in multiple ways. I guess where, where I'm coming from, when you have kids in high school who mm -hmm. are, you know, in intensive reading, they graduate through the intensive reading program and they're put into um, a gen ed, gen ed English class where it's assumed that you know what a haiku is. It's assumed mm -hmm. that you know, you know, all these different literary terms. Is that something that this, um, I guess, covers or is that more, it's going to be more remediation once they get into a gen ed classroom? So once they're in a gen ed classroom, they don't have access to Lexia. Okay. Lexia is accessed through our um, intensive reading courses. Only. Only. Okay. Because if you introduce this into your ELA block, mm -hmm. then it interrupts the ELA time. You only have 15 minutes. Right. Um, and then we kind of negate some of that online work. So that would be through that teacher providing those supports. Okay. But we try to close those gaps 
Like uh, that is our goal for intensive reading right now. Let's close these gaps and create successful readers where then it's just as any other reader in the ELO block where they would need some of that support. Okay. And I think it mostly belongs in intensive reading because when it first year came out, I used it a lot as an English teacher. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about gaps, you could have a kid in sixth grade who absolutely struggling with reading with a piece and then you find out it's because of the diphthong OU and he can't say mm -hmm. or understand any word for that rhymes with pronouns. Mm -hmm. And so that would be very time consuming in a regular ELA classroom right. to take a kid back like six years. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm grateful that ELA teachers have access, but it's also very complicated for them. It, it really is. It's, and I, I mean, that just speaks beautifully to what Michelle Sato was saying, that MRI to know. Because if, when you look at those students that have been struggling with reading and you haven't done a diagnostic to know why, then we're not really truly addressing it to, to close those gaps for them. This really helps teachers understand where those gaps are and close them. Yeah, I'm just thinking about those kids who, like you said, are they they are missing some basic yeah. mm -hmm. um, phonemic awareness. That's why we've gone to the um, screen students before they are placed in an intensive reading classroom. Mm -hmm. Let's really look at where they are, where those gaps are, create those light groups, and give them the teachers materials for direct instruction mm -hmm. to to really close those gaps. Right. So that we can close those gaps and get them to be successful readers. So this focuses in strictly on the, the reading portion of things. You're not really looking at their understanding or knowledge or um, mastery of grammar or composition. Right, not, so, not, the, not the ELA standards, right. the way you're thinking of right. foundational skills. For reading. However, I will add a little addendum to that. In the power up for the older grades, yes. it is broken into uh, word study, grammar, and then comprehension. Oh. So it, because of the structure of grammar impacting the meaning of what you're reading. Yes. So it's not that traditional sense of writing grammar. It is that how does the grammar piece inform your understanding. Okay. So it does cover that. And that's the piece that um, we've really done a lot of training on this year for administrators and intensive reading teachers. They need this portion. Mm -hmm. So they were loving the word study. They were loving the comprehension. But we've got to get them interacting with that grammar piece. And the grammar and piece is very useful. Yeah. Is fluency measured by this, or is that left to the classroom teacher? They do provide fluency supports mm -hmm. through this, uh, but really, you're going to get that interaction with the teacher through so that, that small one group one. time mm -hmm. for that either small group or one on one. Okay. Um, it's not a program where you can read into it and it, right. it would get your fluency rates. Okay. Okay. So, does Lexia impact student data? This is a snapshot of three different things. So the top one is the class table. When you open up Lexi or Power Up as a teacher, I'm going to see my class table. It will have all of my students listed below and give me specific information. How much, how many, much time have they spent? Where are they? What level are they on? But across the top, it gives me immediate information. As soon as the student is interacting, they finish a lesson, it automatically feeds in for the teacher to know. So I know that this teacher, we have five that need usage. So that they have units that they complete so that you know that they're progressing through the program. There are five that have not met that. Now, as a teacher, I may know that three aren't going to meet it this week because I'm spending additional time with them, or maybe they're an ELL student who is engaging in other learning. But I need to know where they are. Like, are we meeting our minutes? Is Melanie playing around? Where is? Then I can do a dive to see, why does Melanie need minutes? Maybe I'm struggling. So then there are four students that need instruction. So snapshot student A, this is a snapshot of a <coughs> skills report that's available in Lexia. So I know that this student went through standard instruction, guided instruction, guided practice, and then direct instruction. And she is still struggling with vowel teams. It immediately notifies me as the teacher, hey, she's struggling. I click on that, and then I can click on those resources right there to print to use in small group. So it is all right there for teachers. And then it gives me information to know, like, okay, so I was doing the skill in class. How are they doing in, this, in the program? And then student B is a student who's rocking and rolling. He's able to do those skills, or she's able to do those skills. But when I got to the long vowel with the sneaky E, I might be struggling. So as a teacher, I'm going to watch for that in application in class. And then we have skill builders 
if a student needs a, a, like they finish that lesson out and they're ready for that scaffold of review for the skill builder, the teacher clicks on it, then pr print the skill builder for that student, and then that can become their independent work for application. And then certificates, this teacher has six students that have completed a level, as Michelle Stato says, that they've leveled up, and they are ready for their certificate. Oops, hey, you, I, you've gone too far. <laughs> and I guess I'm done. It finished it for me. What is happening? <laughs> okay, so that progress monitoring piece for data only works if the teacher is logging in. So we wanted to look at how many times is a teacher interacting with the program each week? This has increased this year by 100 teachers. And it's daily. We even had a teacher or two that logged in over um, Thanksgiving break. So <laughs> they were working. We had students that were working in it. So there were 104 teachers that logged in at least once. That's what it was. Sorry. So we know that teachers are engaging in, in Lexia daily. Is there not a requirement for them to? You say 100 more, does that mean like 500 so when you think did about it last year, 600 did it this year? Well, this year, year we have um, about 700 each week that are logging in consistently. When you think about we're in our third year of implementation, so I do think that we have grown in understanding. We've provided a lot of professional learning around it in the last year. Yeah. Uh, we're in a, in a growth of understanding that it is more than just a... Right. Here is a program for a student to be on um, while I pull small groups. It's way more than that. And I think this year you're really seeing that take, that third year implementation take hold. Okay, on go once. So again, going back to the survey, uh, we asked teachers, how do you feel Lexia is impacting student data? And about 68% scored it a four or a five for um, great impact. And I think some of that could be attributed to, and because it was K to 10 that we gave the survey to, so some of those lowers may be because they're not using it as much in intensive reading, and that was some of the feedback. We don't really use it as much as we did previously. But Lexi is also, they completed a comparison of PM3 last year with where students were in Lexia, and found that 86% of the students that are working in their grade level are likely to make a three, four, or five. They're going to do that again at PM3 this year. When they were completing the work with the comparison for the last PM3, the state was going through the changing of the um, skill scores. So we really want to bring that to you with the data that is stabilized. One. Okay. So this is that celebrating student success. So Mr. Bosky. Um, has completed level 10. He is Alexia superstar. So I just wanted you to see when the when it on that class table on that class table where it says that the, the teacher has six certificates to print. This is what that certificate looks like. It tells a student these are the skills that I am able to do now, and it also has that at home. At home, we can practice these things in order to get my student to the next level. Then at the top, there's a snapshot of um, a kindergarten teacher. Now, this was probably back in October. I saw this, and I was like, and then I shared it in something that we share out with teachers that I'll talk about. But the students, when they finish a level, the teacher goes with them, and they move their clip, and they talk about, look at all the things that you're able to do, because under here, those are the skills that they accomplished in each level. And then they celebrate and move up, and now you're going to be working on these things. So it really does kind of level level up, level them up. Then below is a second grade teacher, and this is something that's available in that resource hub. So it is a visual of each level that students would progress through, and then they move their number dots up. Now in upper grades, you're not going to use these systems more than likely, but I've seen a lot of tracking the number of units you've completed. Um, I, there was one class I walked in and it was like the Lexia Wall of Fame. So all of the certificates were printed and then they were posted all around the room. So I think celebrating that student success is a big piece of that because it, it excites you. They get, as the administrator that printed these in color for a school, I would have kindergartners, oh, Ms. McIver, have you printed the certificates yet? I'm, let me go do that right now. They were very excited to see that and have that celebration of their success. I'm waiting for my... 
teacher printed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to print it. I'm going to post it up for you, Mr. Rosky. <laughs> But you might get displayed in the boardroom. <laughs> <laughs> we have those nice boards now. We can do that really. Um, this only really works through a partnership with Lexia. So part of that partnership is I meet with them and my team meet with them monthly. And they have their whole department there. So it's somebody from their letters team. It's somebody from their um, IT team. It is the professional learning team. It is the support team. And we all talk about where are we? What supports have schools received? What are the next steps? What do we need as a district? What are our celebrations? All of those things. They're there to collaborate. They've really helped us with our intensive reading since we have changed the format of it. How do we really make it beneficial and give us the biggest impact for using Power Up? And then they provide professional learning. Each school receives two on-site trainings and three online trainings. We've currently as consumed over half of those. I think we're at 65% now. So we're really hoping to get us up there. But um, the beauty of this is at each school, the principal determines like what training needs to happen. If I'm a principal with a lot of new teachers, I know that I need new teacher sessions, and then I need teachers that have been in the program for a, a while that's going to look different. So you can really customize it to your school's needs. During pre-planning, they gave up, we had two sessions um, that were packed. They were packed full of participants. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And then the administrator session. So Lexia came and presented during the administrator workshops um, each month. They came in October and January, and they brought data with them and had those conversations about Okay, so where are students and how do we use the program? What should you be seeing in classrooms? What are next steps? Talking at the table to really collaborate around some of the practices across campuses was very beneficial to see how everybody else is using it. And then part of that survey is as, what do you recommend? Asking the teachers. So 86%, 83.6% said let's continue with Lexia and power up. Core 5 and Lexi Power. Uh, 3.9, that's the red. We don't really need a, a computer assisted program. And then three teachers wanted iReady, two teachers wanted iReady and Achieve together, and then 5% wanted Achieve 3000. And there were a few, a few different ones um, that they would like to see Lexia plus something else. So there was a few. So this was K through 10? Yes. Because that would answer this 5% of G3000. Yeah. It's, it, it, depending on your level, mm -hmm. you may or may not want that. So that's right. what it was. Yes, so it was every. K through three? Everybody, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we want to build efficacy to make this a more impactful program. It's not just a computer program, it is so much deeper than that. So. My team has developed um, weekly action steps that are delivered through the superintendent's weekly briefing, and then administrators um, include that with their communication with teachers. Once you have the link, it just keeps updating because we just add to the same document. So this is an example snapshot of Core 5. The green would be a novice teacher. They need to know how to find the things. So where do you click? How do you get to it? The yellow is an intermediate teacher. I have experience in it. I know how to find it. Now what do I do with it? And then your blue, that is your advanced teacher. I've used it. What are my next steps to make it better? And then we also have increased on-site trainings. We, again, have consumed almost 65% of our trainings, which is a, a big jump from last year. And then administrators can see every kid. But we wanted to give rights to somebody that they designate on their campus to be able to dive into that data. Maybe it's a tutoring group they can build. Maybe it's something that they wanted to track a grade level. But they can assign a teacher or a um, ITF or a member of their staff to be able to look at it, to have that other resource, and to be able to train teachers on looking at it. So they designated somebody and then we trained them on how to interact with the program for that data piece school-wide, because it looks different school-wide than it does at a classroom view. And then we really wanted to make sure that we're including this in what we're showing to teachers. If we want them to use it with efficacy, let's, let's make sure we include that. So we have a small group training, and that was included in our small group training, so we talked about those resources and tools. 
And then data review, when you look at FAST data, you should also be looking at classroom data, classroom teacher observations, classroom assessments, but you should also look at Lexia. How are all of those showing the progress of a child? And then standards-based planning, when we're talking about those standards, especially some of those that we know students are struggling in, poetry being one of them for fifth grade, like what resources are available? And again, going back to those curriculum maps, really embedding those resources in the curriculum map has been very beneficial to, to help teachers maximize the tools without maximizing time spent finding the things. So that is the Lexia Lexi, in a nutshell. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So a couple, of, a couple of quick things, if you, if you would, uh, Bonnie, if you can go back to the one with the reading rope. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a couple of things I want to point out. Because uh, actually, we didn't have a reading department three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, since then, we've formed a reading department. You now uh, allocated the supervisor. Uh, Mr. Guy is the supervisor there. But, there's a there's a lot to it. You know, one of the things that I instantly recognize that we didn't even have a literacy department, and a lot has been going on in the area of literacy. And quite frankly, I'm proud of, particularly K2 literacy. Mm -hmm. I wanted to point out a couple things about that. One, you know, literacy is based on comprehensive evidence-based practices, and sometimes you know people like to do what they like to do, mm -hmm. even if it's not necessarily evidence-based or in alignment with the science of reading. It's because I did it last year, so therefore I'm going to do it again this year. But, but is it good? Is it evidence-based? Is it aligned with the standards? That's been a total revamp over the past three years to get us to a point where it's evidence-based, based on the standards, using tools that are proven to be successful. And this is one of those tools. I think it's helpful to talk a little bit about how data is contrived. And uh, data, when I look at the reading data, I point this out. Data is comparative. You have to compare the data. So when you have data and you don't compare it to something, it's kind of an isolation. So if I were to say to each of you that I'm going to pay you $100 an hour to do your job, you would say, that's great. $100 an hour sounds like a lot. But if you found out everybody else was getting $200 an hour, you would think that's not so great all of a sudden, right? Data is compared. So $100 an hour sounds good until you compare it. Let's just take other test data. If I said to you that you got a, 20, a 36 uh, on your test, you would say that's not good, right? 36 is not good. That's a perfect score on the ACT. Perfect score. 100%. If you took the same 36 and applied it to the SAT, you're in the lowest 2% to ever take the test, because that's on a 1600 scale. So I kind of point out, because I see people, you know, making comparisons and using data inappropriately, and so I just kind of set the record straight and give you some facts. When you look at the facts, when you add up all students in Clay County, every single student in Clay County, and their reading performance, and you compare it to all other students in the state of Florida. Clay County ranks 12. 55 other districts would love to have the data that Clay County has related to reading. When you take a look at that by grade level, for sixth grade, we're second in the state of Florida. Compare it, right? Comparative data. When you take a look at 10th grade, we're sixth out of 67. So what am I telling you? Those are facts. They're not Facebook. They're truth, not Twitter. I can't come up with the I yet, but I'm still working on it for Instagram. If anybody has an I word, I'll be glad to use it uh, in the future. But I just wanted to point that out to you. The other part about reading, reading's a complex process. If I were to give everyone in this room a, a reading test, we all score differently. I read, right? Everybody agrees with that? Absolutely. Okay. So I, I see people making statements like, uh, they can read or they can't read. That's, that's just not, not appropriate. And absolutely uh, ignorant as to the process of reading and how reading works. You can see up there kind of the quick analogy, because this is, 
you can tell I'm passionate, I love this stuff, right? When you see that rope up there, you see eight different skills, they all get intertwined. If you have all of those skills, your rope is strong. If you don't have all of those skills, let's say you're missing one or two or three of those skills, your, your rope is not as strong. The question is, do you still have a rope? Yeah, you're still reading. You're just reading at a different strength or at a different level than everyone else related to it. The chart that you see on left is Florida kind of took Scarborough's reading rope, which is the, uh, the, the premier science of reading, and kind of broke it down to six parts, right, instead of eight. That's all that that is when you look at those two, at those two graphs. Uh, a program like Lexia allows you to diagnose which one of those need to be strengthened. In theory, if you strengthen all of them, then your rope and your ability to read it is strong. How many of you are great test takers? Yeah. Right? Some are, some aren't, right? All of that kind of factors into it. You know, making a, a, a statement like uh, reading or not reading is like going to the doctor and the doctor saying to you, yeah, you're sick. Like, what does that mean? Like, and then what do we do about it? Right? It's much more complex than that. And so it kind of drives me a little nuts when I see people uh, making those sorts of comparisons without any sort of comparable data. Like, what does that number mean? I gave you the 36 as being the lowest SAT test taker and the highest in the ACT. Having context for data is so very, very important. MTSS is the process by which we diagnose which one of those areas need to be improved and then um, provide the prescriptive path in order to do that. It doesn't replace the teacher, but in today's world it's become a necessary thing. Imagine the teacher trying to figure that all out as he or she is teaching students all day. I just wanted to give some kudos, anecdotal evidence, all right? Okay. Um, I taught inclusion ELA most of my career. And in my last year in sixth grade, Lexia comes out. And I was in sixth grade, very relatively new to elementary school. And I'm going to tell the story. I'm not bragging. I'm going to tell the story because this is evidence. In, when Lexia came out, I grabbed data. That's what I am. I'm a data person. I can figure out problems through data. And that year was the year after COVID. It was a very tumultuous year. Um, didn't really know who would be there. Kids were in and out. And I sat down and I perfected my small groups using Lexia. It was intensive, planned, absolutely done every single day. And when they say small group, it could be just pulling one child over going, EE -E says E, and giving them a worksheet. It was that quick. Every day I could small group 30 of my 65 sixth graders. I get a call from my principal before I even look at data that year. And 100% of my ESC kids went to level three. I had 100% gains and 100% BAM. If you ever want to learn about how to teach reading, this program will help you. And Ms. Skipper, you often talk about having more help in the lower levels. For me, it's not the lower levels that are a problem. That's right. It's having somebody in 10th grade who reads on the third grade level. That's the problem. And so support for teachers to be able to teach this type of intensive small group. A lot of teachers say they know how to do small group, but they really don't. This is the thing. It's a gift. And you have to learn that gift, and you have to practice that gift, and you have to be committed to that gift. And I, I always had good scores, but never had 100%. And I have to give some credit to Lexia. That was when they were allowing ELA teachers to use it. It was like a chuck up in the air first year, and I just did use it. So this, Miss Skipper, is that intensive second person in the classroom, always. And I could handle it with 90 kids, as long as this program was helping me customize for every one of my students. That's thank, thank you, Ms. Hanson. So, so just wanted to kind of, because we got another meeting coming up, wanted mm -hmm. to kind of bring this quickly to an end. The board asked for this, so I kind of created this document mm -hmm. for that. Alex, in case you wonder what Alex is, the um, McGraw Hill Math Adoption. When you look at secondary math, they're in coursework. That could be in algebra, geometry, mm -hmm. algebra two, 
like it's not as linear as elementary school is. So that's the program that's used as part of our textbook adoption there related to that. So Mr. I'll, Rassen, I do have one card from an audience member. Oh, sure. So we can address that really quickly. Hey, I just had a question about C3 on the consent agenda. There was no detail backing that up. And you had- What is, um, what is C3? Um, proposed settlement allocation the 2425. Handbook. Will there be other um, supplemental allocations um, proposed? Yes, there's actually three different ones. I thought I reviewed this. One, one- uh, you, you talked about the ones that were in this that we can't see that's a detail. I was just wondering, will there be in the consecutive school board meeting other allocations? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We could add all allocations for supplements at any time as part of the as part of the monthly return. In fact, we did that for the fourth year. Okay, because I was concerned about one supplement that we had discussed that okay. um, in bargaining that would be brought before the school board, and I didn't know if it had been brought uh, before the school board. Yeah. And if it's not on this particular package, we can add it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so board members, we have about four minutes before we're supposed to begin our next scheduled meeting. Um, Mr. Superintendent, did you have anything further? I did. Can I? Can you? Can you check your calendars, uh, board member? April tenth. April tenth is the executive <laughs> session. It should be already be on your calendar yep. with our labor attorney. I just want to make sure that we reminded you of that. And also, I'd like the board to consider. We could talk about it at a different time. The June workshop, which is scheduled for June 18th, is the same day as summer leadership, which is our district-wide summer leadership. And I'm, I'm wondering if we could change that to the 17th if the board was in agreement to do so. And I just wanted to provide enough notice. So um, can the board give me consensus for the 17th versus the 18th? I'll be, attending that, I'll be attending that workshop on the phone. So whatever day you want to do it, I'll be on the phone. 17th is fine for me. Okay, yes, seeing the yes. consensus of the 17th, thank you so much. Um, board members, any comments? Mm -hmm. No? Mm -hmm. All right, anything from you, Mr. Bloss? No, ma'am. All right, at this time, this meeting is adjourned. Oh, what about Mr. Adams? Mr. Bloss. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, oh, I need to get okay, well, you. Okay, well, we can do this in less than a minute. I, I, uh, okay. thank you. We're not taking off. Open the power. Um, Yes. Okay, so Mr. Walker, help me through this. How do I reconvene the meeting? Um, so you would just you would just uh, gavel the meeting and say we're we're going to reconvene. Okay, we're going to reconvene. Sorry, Lance. Oh, no problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> believe it or not, I have a reading endorsement. Reading is tough. All right, to teach reading is extremely tough. However, um, I was I, I guess when word gets out, I start getting approached by. Other folks, as you know, we sold land in uh, Montclair. So I've been approached by this uh, gentleman that um, he lives right here, and this is Swing Print Creek Elementary, and we own from here, and it comes up here, and we own this little triangle. It's about six tenths of an acre. Um, he's requested to um, purchase, and I told him I would bring it up to the board. So uh, we also own this sidewalk right here. Can you go to the next one? Okay. So quickly, the, the pros of this is that um, the land is currently being leased as a staging area for um, CCUA, for a contractor for CCUA. Um, and as you know, when word gets out, uh, we'll probably, with all the work going on over on 220, they'll probably, somebody else will probably approach us. So we, are, we do generate a little bit of income through that land. Um, the, 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 the lessee that's there right now, I require them to put brand new fencing up so as part of their lease, so they put brand new fencing up that blocks that sidewalk so that the students can still walk down that sidewalk. And um, if we do sell it, uh, obviously less land and Clayton will be happy for this. If we do, if you all decide that you would like to sell it and pursue that, um, less land equals less maintenance and less liabilities. However, the cons after the lease terminates, um, we won't have any income. Does that mean that we will get more income? I don't know. That just depends on whether the county or CCUA or somebody else approaches us for a state area or something like that. Um, and then if we do keep it, then the land has to continually be maintained by the maintenance department. So basically what I'm asking from you all as a consensus is would you like for me to contact uh, the gentleman and say yes, we will pursue or 
you're not interested. That's that's basically all it is. How much acreage did you say? It's six tenths of an acre. So so I mean, little, if it generates fifty thousand, I don't know. We will get one hundred percent of that fifty thousand. Part of the stipulation when I sell the property is we don't pay any of the seller's fees in closing. They pay everything. So um, are, these, are people just storing a bunch of like construction stuff in there? Right, right. It's construction equipment. Oh. It's a staging area, and and being that I am in facilities. Construction does need staging areas. They really do need it. Um, however, it is a way, if you look at it, it is... How much do we generate a year off of the lease? I think it's about, it's not It's not a huge amount. It's about 7200 Wow. So, a year? But in, in a year, right? I think we're releasing it for about 600 a month to, for them to put their... And people are living all around that. Right. So this is the gentleman that area. wants to... And believe it or not, I don't think that he actually lives here. I think there's a home right over here, but it looks like it's being renovated or something like that. He has a large, he put a large warehouse right here, mm -hmm. and that he's using, I guess, as a, as, you know, a toy area. That's all I can think of. But kids do travel this. If we do sell it, part of the stipulation is that I will keep this little sliver right here, and we'll keep that new fence that I required them put up. And then we will still have to maintain that so that the kids could, um, that they can walk through this. So that would be part of the stipulation. Um, you know, it's kind of your decision, however you guys want to go with it. And if you don't feel that there's a need for this property for us, for a staging area of some sort okay. in the future, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be opposed to selling it. I agree. I also think it's, I don't know, for me, it's just having kids walk by an area that's just a staging area. It just seems kind of strange. Like if I was a parent, I really wouldn't want that staging area there, probably. Well, there's I agree a big, with Ms. But there's, but there's a fence there, right. so it, it is protected. Right. And it's, and it's well, a back, I understand it's that. a back sidewalk to swimming pen off 220. So I would have sat there one yeah. afternoon yeah, just to see how many kids go through. I sat right there and watched um, dismissal. I mean, if it was eight kids, I'd be surprised. Yeah. It was very, 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 very yeah, good. I wonder why you're Well, that's the cut through. To the <laughs> 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 I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't the cut through to the, the mobile management. Kids yeah. All right, guys, if I could bring this to a quick consensus. Yeah. Do we all have agreement in, for selling? Okay. okay. High price on 220 right now. <laughs> that's right. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. This meeting's adjourned. It's more than eight kids. Mm -hmm. Duty, duty station. Yes. I'm ashamed. 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 I'm ashamed.